So, if you have a Chumash, if you look at page 38, 39, this is after the Mabel. The Hashem, um, Hashem tells Noach he may leave the Teva, and Noach comes out of the Teva and builds an altar. He brings sacrifices on the altar. And the verse tells us, Vayarach Hashem Mesereach Hanichayach. Hashem smelled, smelled the pleasant aroma. Vayomer Hashem Elibo. And so Hashem said to himself, Lo osif lekalel od es ha'adama. I shall no longer curse the earth, ba'avur ha'adam, because of man. Why? Ki yetzer lev ha'adam ra min urav. Because the inclination of the heart of a person is evil from his youth. And therefore, v'lo osif ot lahakos es kolchai kasher asisi, I will no longer smite all living beings as I have done. So this is basically where Hashem says that there will no longer be what has just happened. There will no longer be a flood. And we understand that that means that even if there's supposed to be a flood, even if people are so wicked that we match the sins of the generation of the flood, Hashem has promised that there would be no flood. Why? This, this says, Od lahakot of Kolchai. I won't ever hit, strike them again. It doesn't say just a flood. We always say, oh, Hashem can strike us in another way, but a flood he won't do again. Right. But that say isn't that, that the uh, sign of the rainbow is not a flood. Doesn't right, that's later. You're right. At this point, he hasn't, Hashem has not specifically said. It's later when he says, yeah, But here he's promising never to... Destroy all okay. living things. I, I hear that. That is true. That is a good point to make, that at least from the way Hashem says it here, which is different than the way that Hashem says it to Noach, there is a change. Here Hashem seems to um, take away any possibility of any doomsday event destroying the world. At least Hash God made uh, uh, act of heaven um, will not happen to destroy all of humanity. It doesn't say here that man can't destroy itself, Seem to be a wonder, wonderful job of leading up to that. Okay, so this, I'd like to take this, these verses, as an opportunity to sort of offer up an introduction into the purpose or the theme of the classes that we'll have on Wednesday nights now for these Parsha classes. So we're calling it Ethical Dilemmas in the Parsha. As we know, uh, much of the Torah, besides for speaking to us and teaching us the halachos of the different mitzvahs in the Torah, the Torah also provides us with guidelines for the way that we're supposed to live, for the way that we're supposed to think, for the way that we're supposed to process. And there are always different kinds of questions that we have in our lives, questions which we face all the time, and we, we deal with these questions every day. And what we're going to try to do is develop the tools to deal with these questions from a, the Torah's perspective, especially in the area of ethics. We think that ethics are logical or that ethics are somehow self-understood because isn't that the whole point? That when something is the right thing to do, that that should be self-understood? But that's not the case. As we can see, that many different people have different systems of ethics, some of them in direct conflict with each other. Uh, I, you know, take a classic example that's always discussed, the fact that in certain societies, um, honor comes before life. And in other societies, um, honor is almost meaningless. And they wouldn't, I mean, forget saying life is more than honor. They don't even know what honor is in certain societies. So how can you have a principle, a basic concept of ethics, which to one society considers more valuable than life itself, and yet you can have another society that completely disregards it and doesn't even consider it, it's almost like something with extra credit or maybe even something to disregard. So 
I'm just using that as an example to show that we can't just use the society at large, which hopefully we'll discuss today, and all these things to build our system, our gauges, and our um, measures of right and wrong. We have to turn to the Torah and try to look inside the what it says, the messages that Hashem gave us, to try to find the answers to these things. <coughs> yeah, I have a question for you about ethics in, in general. Like, what do people who are non from non-religious aspects, how do they decide on their ethics? Like, where does that come from? Um, so w we'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, how do basically what you could have is philosophers sit down, sit around the table, and start discussing: is this right or is that right? Oh. And well, th that, that, that's what happens later. But first, you have these philosophers who sit down and come up with these things of what's right and what's wrong. Then, as people have already been taught in books and in schools the difference between right and wrong within that society, now people, uh, people's um, personalities and things come into place. And so you'll have people who will be defending a certain approach of, of right and wrong and people who will do the opposite. And once politics becomes involved, then you have the human factor because it's the humans making decisions based on their feelings. So if I feel that it's more appropriate that, you know, let's say a certain group of people should be mistreated within a society, so then I can if I speak well enough and I explain well enough why these people are less human than everyone else, I can then explain that it's actually ethical and proper and moral for us to subjugate and perhaps even destroy these lesser people. And I'll show it. I'll explain it to be moral and ethical because I've got an agenda and I'm using already established givens such as it's okay to hurt certain people for the sake of the greater good, right? That's a concept we've all heard of. So if I can use that and misuse that, I can then use it to destroy others. But that's the problem is that if we're using what we would like should happen, if we're building our morals and our ethics based on our personal feelings of how things should be, we're very likely to be biased and try to represent things. And, and what's worse than doing the wrong thing is doing the wrong thing and convincing everyone is the right thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, and that's, that's what we want to try to avoid, especially in the realm of ethics, where it doesn't say in the Torah specifically, these are the laws of how, how you shall um, you know, talk about other people. It just says, love your neighbor like yourself, and it gives you these general guidelines to the some specifics, but mostly it's up to us to try to understand it. But if we look closely at the Torah, hopefully we'll find the... Um, a better understanding of it. Right? Okay, so that said, let's raise the first question. Hashem just said, I will no longer decimate mankind. Let's use that term. Why? The words are, Ki yetzer lev ha'adam ra min urav. The inclination of the heart of a person is evil from his youth. What does that mean? God given the evil inclination to begin with. Okay, so the uh, one understanding is that he has an evil inclination. Okay, um, why is that? Isn't that the whole point that Hashem gave you an evil inclination and told you to not listen to it? And if you do listen to it, you get, you're supposed to get destroyed. How is this an excuse? Or let me say this a little differently. Let men live. Okay. So, so are we saying then that Hashem is, can I use the word invent, but coming up, creating this new understanding of man, which um, somehow is, enables this person to get away with things, right? Let's turn in the Chumash. Hold on to this page. Let's turn to the Chumash, to page 26. I'm not the first one to see this contradiction. This is raised by quite a few commentaries. When Hashem decides to destroy mankind, take a look at the uh, Pasig Hey. Vayar Hashem and Hashem sees, uh, this is in Parshas Bereshis, Vayar Hashem, Hashem sees, Ki Raba Ra'as Ha'adam, that great is the wickedness of man, 
Ba'aretz on the earth. The Chal Yetzer Machshavos Libo and all the inclinations of the thoughts of his heart, rak ra kalayom, are only evil all day. Basically, these guys are just looking to do bad things all day. <coughs> so, do you notice how Hashem is using the fact that basically people are bad people as a reason to destroy the earth? And then, in our parsha. Hashem seems to say, well, listen, they've got an evil inclination which makes them do bad things, so let's, let's no longer destroy them. Are we, are we using the same verse to explain why we did destroy them, and we're using almost the same form of words to try to explain why they should not be destroyed? I, I think anyone who looks at these two verses, it's clearly, there's, uh, it's not a contradiction because there's some change occurring. But the question is, what, what changes things here? What, what happened between then and here in terms of how we understand the evil inclination in order to justify that at first Hashem says, I'm going to destroy mankind because he has this evil inclination which makes him do bad things. Then Hashem says, I cannot destroy mankind because he has an evil inclination that makes him do these bad things. I think maybe the word, that, I don't know if you're trying, if you're asking that rhetorically or not, so I... No, please. I, yeah. I, I mean, the difference in the word call, in the first case and not in the second case, is, um, I mean, that there, that there is, a, 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 as Steve said, there's the Yetzir Hara, but the, in the first case, it seems to be that that, had, that Yetzir has total control, and that's the difference. That okay, so uh, I hear this chat. Uh, in other words, what uh, Dr. Robinson is suggesting is that maybe the first verse is referring to people who are completely lost to their evil inclination, while this verse is referring to people who are not. The problem is there has yet to be any change. There hasn't been that man lived another 500 years, and then Hashem said, oh, you know what, these guys are bad, but they're not so bad, so I'll let them live. This is, this is directly after that. Hashem says, okay, I'm no longer going to do this because, so you're right that Hashem doesn't mention that they're completely wicked, but why not? Aren't they still in danger of becoming completely wicked? So I think, well, going along with what Bob said, rock, it's also rock, rock, only bad. I mean, no, I think that is a support for, for no, what you were right, saying. So there's no good in here. And so what's changed now? So now... Hashem said, okay, let's look at this picture now. There's Noach and his sons. We, maybe there's something we don't know about what Noach and his sons have right. done besides the, the... But it doesn't even seem like it's referring to Noach. It's saying, you know what? Yetzir lev ha'adam. It's, it's almost, right. like, almost like even those people who were killed... You know what? It was, it was, they had an evil inclination that overwhelmed them. So I'm no longer ever, even if man becomes like that, even if man becomes so bad that they deserve to be destroyed, and they do become like the Dharma, but it's not going to happen. Because from now on, we have this understanding that uh, man is uh, unable to control himself to some but, extent. But the same Pasuk says that that Hashem smelled the, the smell of the uh, pleasing odor as part of the, the whole thing. Is all this. So it must be that there's something about what that Noah and his carbon did, and maybe that it, he reflected on, you know, whatever, whatever that means that Hashem reflected. But, you know, that he saw what, what Noah and his sons and what had happened on the ark, on the, you know, on the teva. I don't know. I mean, it could be. It's just a lot to put into this verse, right? Because um, the, the verse doesn't seem to be saying, wow, um, something's changed about man, but if it's more a specific focus on Noah, I mean, you could say that. It's just a lot, a lot to put into the verse. Yeah. I mean, I never thought about it before, but we say that uh, a Kurdish war who wanted to create the world, he just had dim. Now he sees that he it needs also Rachemim. Right, so it's interesting you suggest that, because usually we say that that happened on day one. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if you want to suggest, and that's a very novel shot, I think you could, you, it definitely you can take it and run with it. But you're suggesting that that switch 
of Hashem wanting to create the world with the attribute of justice, and then Hashem said the world saw the world couldn't survive, and added to it the attribute of mercy, that that happens right here in this verse. That's that's a very nice chiddush. I I I, I, I was not going anywhere near there, but I so, want to try one other thing, which would I, I you mean. should you should take that around. That is that a mukam mukhar So perhaps uh, here um, uh, it is so Noah was the best that. You know, he was a tzaddik in his generation, but in the end, ends up uh, degrading himself. So, if this uh, statement w- would be saying that e- even the best you know, you know, people with the best intentions have a problem, then maybe um, this, this is sort of with foreknowledge. Uh, um, uh, I hear. I mean, I, I, you're gonna, you're going to have to again use the Ein Mugdam Amochar, which I don't know how quickly we want to jump to that. Furthermore, here it does give a timing for it because it's while the Karbanas are brought, which is immediately after the Teva, before the vineyard is planted. But okay, all right. So if you take a look. I we have copies here of the Midrash Rabbah on this verse. Okay. Amar Rav Chia. I underlined the part we're going to look at. Amar Abichia. Rabba aluva hi ha'isa. How shameful is the dough. Shenachtoma meyed aleha shihira. That even the baker testifies it's evil. <laughs> now, how embarrassing is that? You know, the baker, the guy who says, listen, uh, oh, don't, don't bother with that cake. That was, that's probably the worst cake I've made all day. Now that's an embarrassment for the cake, because if the customer says, oh, that was a terrible cake, that's one thing. But if the baker himself refers to the dough as bad, what, a, what an embarrassment. So Rebchia says, we as mankind, we're the dough, and the baker himself says, oh man, this, this is a bad, bad batch, is the word I think to use, right? To which Abiyosi HaTorsi Omer, Abiyosi, from, I guess from the place called Tursi, Amar, he said, Aluv hu hasaor. How shameful is this leavening agent? <coughs> Shemisha bara also. That its own creator, Meyud alav shuhura, talks about him as being evil. Shanamar, as it says, Ki hu yada yitzreinu. Hashem, you know our inclination. Zachur ki afar anachnu. Remember that we are dirt. Okay, so... Now, the second opinion says, no, 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 you got the wrong mashal. You have the wrong analogy. This is not a case of the baker referring to the dough as bad. This is a case where the baker refers to the leavening agent or the sourdough put into the... Right? In those days, they didn't have um, Fleischmann's yeast. You had to... Um, you took a piece of dough that had previously risen and had turned into a sourdough and then which that original dough might have taken hours and hours and hours to to rise then you take a piece of that and you put it into your dough so that becomes the leavening agent which makes your dough rise so that's called saor in the torah so the analogy should be that the baker says what a terrible piece of sourdough, it does a terrible job of rising the bread. <coughs> so he said, ruined my dough. Ruined my dough, exactly. Very good. That's a great way to put it. Rabban and Amri, the rabbis say, no, no, no. You, both of you have the analogy wrong. Let me give you the proper analogy. Aluva Hanatia, how shameful is the planting, the tree, Shemishinata, that the person who planted it himself, Meyad Allah Shihira, testifies that it's evil. Shanamar, as it says, Vashem Tsvakos, Hanutea Osah Hashem himself, who planted you, Diber Allah Ra speaks evil of you. Okay, so he says he doesn't like this parable with the dough or the sourdough. He says, no, no, that's not what it is. This can be compared to a farmer who plants a tree. And the tree gives forth fruit, and all the guy, people who come through his field to buy apples, he says, listen, don't take apples from that tree, that's a bad tree. So how shameful is that tree? So here it's a little bit harder, 
um, to understand what, what, what's his problem with the previous two explanations. What's the disagreement here? But the problem with the last mashal is that Hashem said Yitzer Hadam, so the whole, all of mankind, not just one tree. It's all well, he's saying tree. a tree is mankind. Uh, the it, whole tree, just one tree. Not right. you said, don't eat from this tree because it's, the fruit's bad, but it's all the tree. Well, that's the analogy: is don't eat from this tree. But here, it, mankind is like the tree that Hashem Himself planted, and Hashem Himself, um, you know, talks about how bad it is. So. What is the what is the disagreement here? So if you see on the side, it's a small print, but I'll read and translate it. The Radal, Rav David Luria, one of the uh, major commentators on the Midrash, he says like this: Man de Amar Haisa, the one who says that this is an analogy of the dough, Mamshil al Kol Gufa Adam, he understands that Hashem here is referring to the entire dough the entire loaf of bread, the entire body of each individual person. In other words, the entirety of man is bad, ki berahu tivo, that the man's nature is evil. The first opinion in the Medrash is saying that this verse is Hashem saying man is by nature evil. Now, I want to be, you have to stop right here when you say this and say, this does not mean that man is by nature damned. That's a different religion. That's not what we mean. What we mean is that a person left to their own devices, even without, is just going to do bad things. Umanda Amar Hasa'or. So the second opinion says, no, no, you're wrong. You can't say dough the way that uh, Jeff put it, it's the sourdough which is going to leaven the dough. In other words, it's some external agent which is going to act upon the dough. Hashem made mankind just fine. It's the sourdough in the dough, which causes it to, um, which ruins it. So what's the sourdough? The evil inclination, which Hashem has placed right. into man. And depending on how much evil inclination the person has, that's how much the person is going to. And of course, everyone hears this all the time, that on Pesach, the reason why we avoid eating chametz is because chametz is dough which has been leavened, and that leavening represents the evil inclination inside of us. And by physically going through this mitzvah where we avoid the, the leavening agent, we are trying to cleanse ourselves of chametz so that spiritually we should be free of chametz. Right? So clearly that explanation only works with the second analogy. What about the third analogy? Says the Radal, Uman the Amar Lenetia, the one who says planting, he says, no, no, you got this wrong. When, when, uh, why does a tree go wrong? Why does a tree grow bad? If the farmer took a healthy piece of wood, which was clean without disease, and planted it in the ground, ready to grow a tree from it, did the fa does the farmer put any, um, anything on it which can ruin the tree? No. What happens to a tree that goes wrong? Something else comes. Not something which the baker put in, but something which the tree itself took in. Which means, No, no, no. The body that was prepared, A person does something to himself. Don't blame the body that Hashem made. That's, that's the first shot. I don't agree with that. But don't even blame the evil inclination that Hashem put into man. Now that's where it says later on in Shoftim about the person is a tree of the field. Maybe. Right? That, that would definitely work with this third shot. Yeah. The problem isn't the evil inclination. Because Hashem didn't make your evil inclination that's going to destroy you. You know? Um, what do you like bre better, soft bread or hard bread? Most people like when a dough rises and it becomes fluffy. That's actually, I mean, spiritually speaking, not, but on a physical level, we want, you know, how, you know what the proof is that it's better when a dough rises? 
because that's what we do when we make dough, we make it rise. So you'll say, but it's, it's blowing it up. That, yeah, you've got to control that. But that's all within man's ability to control. Hashem gave you who you are, then Hashem gave you an inclination, and that inclination is still under control. When the tree starts to grow, all of a sudden the tree <coughs> starts to do this and do that and grow funny and change things, and that's why the apples that come out of it are bad. Not because something that the farmer has done to the tree, but something the tree has done to itself. Not because Hashem made you in a certain way that you're going to be wicked, but that Hashem saying here, I made them just fine. But man is continuously going astray. But that doesn't fit with Rami Urav. That bad from... Oh, so he says, Margil Tiva Urav. What happens is, we bec- accustom ourselves from our youth. Right. In other words, when we do something to create within ourselves, in our youth, in our younger years, when we don't yet have the skills to develop properly and we're making our own decisions and making our own mistakes, at that point we allow ourselves to, we do something beyond our natural evil inclinations. And then once we get stuck, once a person becomes who they are, this we discussed um, in the tshuva classes, once you're somewhere, now it's really hard to change. Once you've become accustomed to a certain way of living and believing and behaving, those behaviors become learned and it's very difficult for a person to change. Yes? But if you're going, if, as I understand the analogy of the tree, where does that influence come from if the tree is good? It would... I mean, I'm understanding it that it comes from the outside. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. There's an outside That's correct. But influence in how does... You see, the, the way the Radal seems to be saying it is that the tree is taking in outside influences. Okay. Right? Which, okay. which I don't know if that quite works in the analogy of the right. tree. Yeah. Maybe, right. maybe we would have tried to come up with another right. example of it. But his purpose in using the tree is not... It's a little different because man, we, may, we have our own devices. But in the case yeah. of the tree, the point being that it's not something that, it's not like in the case of the leavening agent where the farmer put it, made the dough, then the farmer put in the leavening agent. So it's really, uh, the baker. So it's, it's really the baker's fault because he put in the, the leavening agent. We're saying it's not the maker of the tree's fault. It's something that the tree itself did, although you're right. In the case of the tree, it's yeah. usually a worm which attacks the tree or a wind or, or a rain which destroys the tree. And here it's something more that we are taking within ourselves. Right, we, where we have a choice and a tree doesn't have a choice. Right. What's the Yitzhahara in that analogy? So, so it's not about the Yitzhahara. It's, and, and that's, what I'm, that, that's what hopefully I'm going to get to. There's two, let's just go straight there because we're going to come back to it. There's two levels of Yitzhahara. And we're going to introduce the common concepts discussed by, by um, the world at large, the two concepts of nature and nurture. Nature is what we understand, what you would be based on your chemical makeup at the time of birth, based on your um, inclinations at the time of birth. In other words, in theory, although it's not really true, but in theory, if we were to lock someone in a room and they would not have any interaction with people but would somehow learn how they could interact with people, which is almost impossible to do, and then you bring out that person, what will that person's attributes be? It will be whatever their nature is. Maybe they could interact with robots who teach them how to learn and whatever. Watch and then, well, no, no, because then, then you're picking <laughs> stuff up. However, nurture is what you pick up. Nurture is what your parents teach you, or whoever raises you, or teachers, or friends, society. or most dangerous, society at large. Those are all nurture. Those are not the way that Hashem made you to be. You could have a person whose natural tendency is towards mercy, but then they're exposed in their lifetime to a lot of cruelty, and they become cruel people. So that, that's something which, that's what we're going to differentiate here. 
There's the evil inclination that Hashem puts inside you. That's the sourdough in the dough. And then there's the stuff that you pick up, which is society at large, or things like that. And here it's actually very close to the example of the tree. Because in the case of the tree, what happens is, this farmer, he took the perfect piece of wood and put it in the perfect place. Now this wood is going to face challenges. It's going to have to deal with um, all kinds of natural events and difficult and droughts and rains. Those are all within the natural expectancy. But then things come from the outside, such as a person who um, you know, lights a campfire underneath that tree, or a worm which attacks the tree. That's like someone having parents who cause them harm, or teachers who cause them harm, or friends who cause them harm, or society which causes them harm. And when I say harm, I mean harm in terms of um, corrupting such a person. So what you're saying, though, that the way things worked out, it wasn't God's intent? Right. That's what, it, that's what this third shot is saying. The third shot, who compares it to the tree, says you've got it wrong. The way Hashem made man, even with his evil inclination. In other words, Adam was born without an inclination. Inside him, it was outside him. Then it comes back inside him. But even there, it was fair and balanced within the person. But then, somehow, society, you wonder, someone's got to be the first to influence, because not everyone can be influenced. So someone became the first to influence and create all these external factors, which then corrupted mankind beyond the inclination that Hashem first put into, into man. Uh-huh. At least that's this third chat. So um, let's, let's go on in the Midrash, and you'll see that... Um, this is somewhat related to the next discussion. Uh, this, there's a similar... Um, How can you say God didn't foresee that? Well, Hashem foresees it, but Hashem doesn't interfere in free will. But so, he knows that's going to happen. Yeah, but it's not Hashem who does it. Our free will allows us to do things to ourselves, and the choices we make in terms of, of good and evil. As we say, the famous Gemara and Nida, where the Gemara says that every person who comes down into the world, the angel comes before and they asks, what will this person be? And they decide three factors about this person. Ani or Ashir, Chacham or Tipesh, or Gibor or Chalash. Is this person going to be rich or poor? Is that person going to be a wise or foolish, is that person going to be strong or weak? Those are the three things. But the Gemara says, V'ilu tzadik v'rasha lo kamar, they don't decide. That means that it's not in your nature as to whether a person will be a tzadik or a rasha. So what happens? Hashem sets you up in a certain way, and then your free will allows you to turn yourself into, and what's happening is when all of mankind is doing this, so, so it's so he changed the way it was originally supposed to be. Right. Man has changed himself to so become. Man has changed himself? Yeah. That's what, that's what this third shot is. It's like the tree. Don't blame, don't blame the dough or the sourdough, which is the farmer's fault. The, this is uh, the baker's fault. It's the farmer who plants a tree, and then the tree grows bad. It wasn't the, it wasn't the farmer's fault. So wait, so therefore God is not going to punish there. with it. With it. A oh, so one second. So why is that a defense of man? Hopefully, we'll get to that. But but that's clearly what these three commentaries are disagreeing about. What this verse is really saying is the excuse of man. But let's finish this message. Shaul Antoninus es Rabbeinu. Antoninus was uh, the Roman emperor who was good friends with the Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, and he said to him, nasun At what point does the evil inclination? Enter a person. Mishiyatsu is it from when he's born? Or is it from the time of conception? In other words, does a fetus in the mother's womb have an evil inclination? Oh, how do you explain Asa? What? How do you explain Asa inside his mother, Russia? Yeah, they, they, the they, they discuss that. And uh, if, you, if you remember, um, Rashi in the Parsha. <laughs> says, Shnei Goyim Bevitnech. So Rashi says, it's not Goyim, Gei. it's Shnei Geim, because there are two noblemen mm-hmm. in your womb. Who are the two noblemen? So, Rabbi and Antoninus, says he, Rashi. He says it, actually, Yotzah. Yeah, 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 we'll get it. So, just like Asa was inside. Yeah, right. But, so, Re- she, but, so Rabbi, she's being told 
that Rebbe and Antoninus are going to come from Yaakov and Esav. So Rebbe and Antoninus are having a debate over when the evil inclination comes. <laughs> but, right? but Rivka says, I can't stand this, that, that they're fighting inside of me, but you wrote to Sue inside of her. Right. So but if one of those kids one was running but if one of those kids out. paskins that there already is an evil inclination, then right. maybe that kid will have an evil inclination. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? That yeah, yeah, no, that, that, the they ask that towards going They, to, they um, ask that question on the Gemara. The commentaries on the Gemara say, well how could you not have an evil inclination than what was Ace of doing? Right. And again one of the answers is that that's Antoninus. Esav is Antoninus, so that's part of this debate. Let, let's see what they say, and we'll see. Amalo, so Rabbi says, um, he gets it even before he leaves the womb. In other words, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi Paskins, that um, the evil inclination, is, a fetus does have an evil inclination. Amalo Lav, Antoninus says, absolutely not. If he was in his, if he had an evil inclination in, in his mother's womb, he would break through to get out. He would start, every time he would walk past the house of idol worship, he should be fighting to get out. So, so it's going to be the same debate. That's what I'm saying. And Rabbi said, you're right. You're right. There's no evil inclination until the fetus comes out. amikra, <coughs> and I found a verse which goes like you, Antoninus. Even though Rabbi Yehuda Anasi is the greatest sage of his generation, he has this debate with the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor logically argues, and Rabbi Yehuda Anasi says, you know, you just explained to me the verse. Shenemar ki yetzer lev ha'adam ra urav. The evil inclination within the heart of a person is evil minurav. What's the translation of minurav literally from his youth? Mm-hmm. But Reb Yudan not Amar before, not before he was born, right? But Reb Yudan, well, that for sure not. But usually we translate minurav as like a teenager or something. Mm-hmm. Reb Yudan Amar minurav ksiv. It's missing above the word minurav, which means mishashu ninar lotzeis mimei imo from his first major movement, which means as he comes out. Or as the word that was taught to Cain, according to some Lepesach, Chatas, Rovets, um, evil sin crouches at the door. Mm-hmm. Meaning that the second he comes out, that's it. Mm-hmm. So therefore, what we're saying is, now I clearly, clearly here, this pshat of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi is he's understanding that the evil inclination, which we're referring to here, is the evil inclination which comes to a person as they're born. In other words, not min urav as you get older and you start to pick things up, but more min urav from the way you're born. So wh- now what that means is that the debate of when a person has an evil inclination is really a debate uh, of what the translation of the word min urav means. The evil inclination in the heart of a person is there min urav, if it means from his youth, then that would mean that as you're growing up, the kind of person that you develop to be, that's the literal reading of the Torah. Min'urav means how your parents raised you, how your teachers affected you, how your friends affected you, and how society at large is influencing you. The other pshat, which is the pshat of Rabbi Yudha Nasi, after he hears Antoninus' explanation, is that no, Min'urav here is referring to the evil inclination which comes to a person as soon as they're born. It's just a question of how to translate the word minurav. So now, we have basically two explanations on how to, how to read this verse. Um, well, really three, but we're focusing on these first two. The first explanation is that the whole sourdough is bad, that all of mankind is just naturally bad. And it could be that that first verse, all the way back in Parshas Bereshis, was kind of like that. I think you had the rock in Kalayom, and that's almost like saying that he's never free from it. That's almost the definition of man, is evil. Mm-hmm. And I, again, he's saying it on this verse, but you can almost connect that explanation to this. And that shot is going to have a harder time recognizing the change. But the other explanations, the other explanations, are saying that something changes from the previous Parsha, where Hashem says, I'm going to destroy mankind because he's evil, and in this week's parsha, 
where Hashem says, no, a person isn't really evil. There's something which is affecting the person. And if there's something that's affecting the person, on a certain level, that's an excuse. So what changes? So um, I, I'd like to bring this back, if I may, to a discussion we had um, uh, maybe a month ago on the concept of teshuva. Uh, the idea is like this, and uh, you are already starting to hint to this with the uh, idea of kapara. What it means is, when a person is, what's one of the reasons why we have a famous statement of our sages that b'makom she bali teshuva omdim, the place where people who have done teshuva stand, tzadikim gemurim enim yecholim lamad, even the most righteous are unable to stand there. Why not? So one of the explanations, I'm sure you've heard, everyone's heard this explanation before, this is the simple explanation of it, because the righteous person has not gone through the climb back up. The righteous person has never fallen far enough to have to dig their way all the way back up. This world was created with the letter Hay. Why was this world created with the letter He? Because the world has three sides. The reason why the world has three sides is that if you do the wrong thing, you can fall out the bottom. In other words, Hashem gave you opportunity to destroy yourself. Hashem put you in the center. You can be that dot in the middle of the He. But... You can very easily fall out. It's your choice. So says the Gemara, well then, in that case, it should be a ches. The world should be created with a ches. The letter with three sides and a hole in the bottom is the ches. Says the Gemara, no, no, no. Because if a person sins, he has to be able to come back in. So says the Gemara, well, come back in the same place you fell out. Says the Gemara, you can never come back the same place you fall out. You have to come from a new door. I never thought about it before, but the letter Chet is Chet. Is ah, interesting. At least in the sound. The sound is the same. Yeah. So you have to have a way to get back in. Okay, so we need a new door. But what's shocking or striking <coughs> is that where would you have put that door? The bottom. I put another door at the bottom. This new door is at the top. Which means when you climb back in, you get all the way back into the top. And so the message is that when a person has fallen and they've gone through the process of picking themselves back up, they actually end up higher than where they started before. That's the lesson of B'makam She Bali Tshuva Omdim, which is at the top of the hay, climbing into that door, is a place where Tzadikim Gemurim, who are just in the center of the hay, are not able to stand. They don't have that entryway. What the mankind experienced was literally falling out the bottom. Man, Hashem said, man has done the wrong thing, and they left the world. They fell out the bottom. And there were two things which happened. There was what we call Onesh and Kapara. Onesh and Kapara are the two parts of atonement. Onesh means retribution or recompense or punishment. So, for example, if let's say someone stole, the punishment would be to um, pay back what they stole. But then you've got another concept called Kapara. What is kapara? But the person does something in the positive. A person will apologize to the person they stole from. Or that person will make restitution to society by doing some community service. Now you've gone beyond just undoing your sin, but you've also done something positive. Onish and kapara. The mabel was the onish. The karbanos that Noah brings are the kapara. And at this point man is at a higher place than they were before they started to sin. They are now the Bali Tshuva. And the Bali Tshuva, the whole world, is Bal Tshuva. At that point, Hashem says they have to be treated differently. 
You can't expect um, the perspective to look at people who have experienced sin, who have experienced the fall, who have um, been, who have fallen. Those are people who have grown up, they've been influenced, they've, they've been bad. They need a different form of treatment. What makes them Bali Chuba? Noach and his family. Yeah. What makes them Bali Chuba? Well, because they, they suffered and bought atonement. That's what we're saying. We're saying Onish and Kapara. And we're, uh, you, you said maybe there was some chuva process. I'm saying at least specifically in those two parts. They suffered punishment. In other words, mankind, which was represented by about a million people before, and now it's represented by eight people. But mankind suffered, got its punishment, and then mankind brought uh, uh, some level of kapara, some level of atonement and reconnection with God. So at, at that point, they are on the level of the Bali Chuva. But is Noah bringing the carbon as a chatat or as um, as a carbon toda? It's uh, an ola, isn't it? It is an ola because there is only ola in those days. But but it's still a carbon, and the carbon is a closeness to Hashem, and that's what teshuva is, a returning to Hashem. It's it, it's I, I'm I'm putting a little more into it than the verse itself gives, but. But the idea is clear that there's some kind of pleasant aroma, and it's that pleasant aroma which initiates, arouses this um, uh, words of these words of mercy from God, where He says, "That's it. The perspective changes." I'm just saying we find that this perspective is already true in terms of the balachuva and the. Uh, just to point this out, um, I, I hadn't thought of this before, but it occurs to me now that. Um, it's interesting that the difference between the hay and the ches is also the difference between chametz and matzah. Mm-hmm. So if if chametz represents the sin of of the, um, in other words, where there's no door to come back, and matzah represents the hay where there is a door or an opportunity to come back, it's almost um, it's, it seems even more amazing that they're using this analogy of the sourdough. Where he's saying it's yeah. the it's the sourdough within which uh, doesn't allow the return of the chesne. Anyway, but let's. So, Rabbi Rucham Lovavitz, in his I'd like to get to the point about ethics. So I'll try to say this quickly. <laughs> Rabbi Rucham Lovavitz, in his Sefer Das Torah, says Yetzer Lev Adam Ra Min Urav, as soon as the child is born, he says. This means that every one of us is faced with a battle. From Bereshis to Le'eni Kol Yisrael, every incident in life is a battle. Take a look at Adam Arishan in the garden. Every moment he was there, he was battling. And you go through the Dora Mabel, the Dora Midbar, he says there is, this is the only war where nobody can take a neutral stance. If a person, if a person were to um, decide his entire life that he's going to avoid every single um, challenge within him, in other words, he'll never do anything wicked or anything good, he'll either die the greatest tzaddik in the world or the greatest Russia. Because if you only do what you're naturally inclined to do, so... Um, there, there is no neutral. You're going to either be doing good things or bad things. This is, there's no Switzerland in the war against the evil inclination. So he says, think about this, that we're saying that the evil inclination starts from when the child is born. The child doesn't even know they exist. A child, when it's born, doesn't know that it's a child. But somewhere, there's already a subconscious. There's already stuff going on inside that child. And the evil inclination, he says, is part of that subconscious. He says, uh, uh, almost a scary thought, he says that means that the only choices in life, every single situation you face, there's only two choices. The right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. So he says, I don't understand what everyone's problem is, just do the right thing. (laughs) <laughs> and he says it almost um, uh, in a, a, a tongue in cheek, but but everything in life is a battle, <coughs> and unfortunately, most of the time, we fool ourselves into thinking 
that the approach that we've taken is the approach which is the result of forethought and consideration. And much of the time, much of the time, the things which we've come up with are things which are actually quite counter to what we're supposed to do. Um, I want to add, uh, yeah, I was going to make this a longer discussion, but uh, I'm cutting that off just to get to this. What we're saying now is that lesson number one in terms of the ethical questions which exist in the world, and maybe I'll pick up on this because this is really a much longer discussion. Maybe we'll pick up on this again at, at another opportunity, is that every single person is faced with constant challenges all the time. Every single person you know is faced with challenges that are unique to them. On three fronts, their, um, um, who they are, their evil inclination, and all the nurture that they've experienced, the people that have affected them. And therefore, lesson number one in the realm of ethics is that we don't have a clue as to what's really going on inside of any other person. And any attempt to make judgment of any other person, or to somehow attri attribute to that person um, fault or wickedness needs to be greatly avoided. Now, that does not mean that we don't avoid evil, but that doesn't mean that that person is somehow evil or corrupt or less. Because if we are to look at any person and say that that person is lesser in terms of their um, being good, then we should turn back to the original statement and say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu already made this judgment about all of mankind. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Ki yetzer lev ha'adam ra min urav, every one of us is all, has all these issues. And perhaps one of the most dangerous attributes that any of us can have is the ability to judge other people and judge them based on our perception of how things should be. So how ironic is it that you could use per perhaps one of the most um, um, evil attributes, which is to judge others negatively, to judge others negatively. So uh, Mr. Jean, we'll, we'll, we'll um, continue on this, but the idea is that what we're going to try to, what we're going to try to learn is to look at the parsha, maybe look at things which we previously looked at or have taken as a given, and try to study them and see what actually is the right thing to do. And uh, hopefully it'll be without judgment, but with the understanding that everyone has their issues, everyone's got their challenges. Halavai, we should all survive ours and uh, focus on ourselves first. Thank you.